Um, right, so I prepared just to... I think there's another question. Oh, sorry. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, just the orientation of the lens in that diagram. Sorry? Um, the orientation of the lens in your diagram. He's obviously wrong. Maximize the aberration. Yes. Maximize the aberration. Well, you know, if I want to be pedagogical, I have to make a caricature. So sure, but I guess my question is, these equations, are they... Oh, no, 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 they're totally general, right? Good. Okay. Yeah, I mean, did I talk about uh, physical systems before? No, no, I mean the minimum scatter focus in the best. Oh, yeah. That's general. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is just to help you visualize the thing, but this is what I've been talking about. Sure, so sure, sure. I, I meant the yeah. best focus. Right, the best focus is always, I mean, I can prove it, just, just, <coughs> just starting from here, and, and, and the best focus is at halfway between the marginal and the ground. Okay. okay. Um, so, okay, just, just, just because aberrations are fun, I made, um, I prepared demos with Oslo to show you, so I, I, I'm going to play with them now. Right, so thanks to your remark, I've put the lens in the wrong orientation. <laughs> um, I want to answer Louis' question with Oslo. I'm going to make a demonstration of what you look, or what you see in the image plane, and I'm going to move it. I'm going to move this uh, the CCD so that you really see what is going on. Okay, uh, later on I'm going to explain how to use OSCO. That's not the purpose now. It's just to make a, a show. Okay. So I've got something. It's not a fancy lens. It's a lens that has a focal distance of 150 millimeters with a diameter of one inch. Infinite focus. I'm going to... Uh, show you... something... right. Okay. I'm going to move the position of the image plane. Okay. So you see, I've moved it by 0 0.1 millimeter in this direction. Well, of course, it doesn't change much. I have to move it by much more. Up, the the spot decreases. Well, uh, keep a, a look, keep an eye on these numbers. This, this is the, uh, this is in millimeters, okay? Sorry. So I can keep going. Decreases. Up. Oh, I'm too far, right? Well, let me come back. So that ring was the caustic. Yeah, be careful, it changes the scale some, sometimes. So yeah, it changes the scale. Okay. So it keeps decreasing, right? What do you see, actually? So at the very beginning, you had this big, big, big hollow. Okay? And I'm, I'm, moving, I'm moving this way. The, ha the, the spot decreases. At the same time, the, there's something that appears in the center. Hmm. There is a trade off. Were you sitting at the paraxial focus? Sorry? Initially, were you sitting at the paraxial focus? Initially, I was at the paraxial focus. Okay, so I keep going. And there is a point, and it's very intuitive. There is a point where uh, 
um, I think I passed it. Yeah, well, the, this hollow and the central spot just merge. This is the minimum scatter. And if I go beyond, here is what's going on. Sorry, so it keeps changing, but I mean, obviously it increases. Okay. And at some point, at some point, there is something here. There is less light. Okay. And this is actually the part of the caustic I was showing before. Yeah. Um, is the rate density at the NRS people uniform across the aperture? It, it, sorry, it, is the rate density uniform across the aperture? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. I did nothing special. Okay, when this uh, light area here comes in, into play, um, you have gone beyond the marginal for Okay, so now let us keep an eye on the dimensions now. Uh, I'm going to come back suddenly to the uh, actual focus. What's the dimension of the spot? Well, roughly, this is one millimeter, so this would be 800 micrometer. Okay, 800 micrometer. Um, with one click, to reverse the lens. It's in the correct orientation. <laughs> What's the new dimension? This is, agree with me, this is approximately 0 0.2. Right? So, the diameter is Zero two, yeah, so zero four. <coughs> okay. So, um, what should I? So, so what's our conclusion about this show? Well, there is a, a, a worst orientation and there is a best orientation. The worst orientation corresponds to the flat surface of the of convex lens heading toward infinity. In this case, I'm, I'm considering the infinite focus. Well, this is the case in the case of a divergent lens. It's exactly equivalent. Everything is algebraic. And this is the best orientation. And I'm not going to do it today. We could do it. Just calculate manually the spherical operation by pushing to the third, to the fourth order the uh, wave aberration by Taylor expanding the wave aberration. And we would show that the, uh, this, uh, the coefficient of spherical aberration of the third order is related to the index of refraction of the lens and to the focal length through this formula. You can do the same thing in the other way around and you would get something different. And if you plug in n equal 1.5, you get the fact that A is approximately four times <coughs> worse in the wrong orientation. Just also, you could show, it's actually a really easy exercise, that the spherical mirror in the same configuration would have uh, a coefficient that is minus r divided by 16. r is the radius of in other words, it's R is equal to um, two, 2 times the total. So it's minus the prime of 32. Mm -hmm. In case you have the choice, you should use a mirror. Uh, because a mirror is approximately, it is more than 32 times better than a lens in its best orientation. Um, also, I plotted the following thing. How does spherical aberration vary with the index of refraction of the lens? 
if you had the choice, would you choose a high N or a low N? The answer is choose a high N. Because functions are, I've shown before, the N minus 1 squared, blah, 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 decrease with N. Both in the worst and in the best orientation. And for N equal 1 to 5, you've got the famous factor 4. And actually, this factor 4 is roughly that it's all over the area of the standard classes that you use in the near infrared and visible spectrum. So the spherical mirror is at the bottom here. Okay? I plotted A divided by F to normalize things. So if you have the choice between a mirror and a lens, for a given focal length, use a mirror. Although we saw yesterday that the mirror is not something wonderful, it has spherical operation. Okay, so I've, to uh, uh, I've told you now all I know about diamond convex lenses and spherical mirrors. Let's go to a singlet in general. Okay. With comparing the uh, lens to a mirror, the lenses have two surfaces. Yeah. You were talking about just going from uh, focusing from outside a block of glass to inside a block of, block of glass is the spherical aberration for that configuration. It seems like that would be the, the fair comparison between a, a lens and a, and a mirror. That could be a fair comparison. It's more fair. So how do you two surfaces? Um, well, for the plano convex lens, uh, it's exactly the case, right? Because the first interface doesn't have any uh, uh, focus, the first plano plane okay. surface doesn't do anything. For the convex plane lens, in the other way, um, I never asked myself the question. Okay. I, um, I have to do it. Uh, okay, so the same but So the question we have now is, is it possible to cancel third order spherical aberration with uh, singlets? The answer is yes, it is possible with a Um Well, and actually I, I, I told you already what I know about it yesterday, uh, because I told you that um, hyperbolic, hyperboloids uh, may be infinite focus configuration, they are rigorously stigmatic. So all you have to do is use um, plano hyperboloid or sing. Um, and actually one to prove that you should uh, use it this way, so this is your lens. This is kind of a hyperboloid. Okay, so First surface doesn't do anything, and this configuration, where this is actually the focal point of the second branch of the hyperbola, this lens is rigorously stigmatic, and so uh, there you are. There is no third order, and there is no fifth order, no seventh order, no none, no spherical aberration. Okay. Well, so that's ideal if you want to focus in fibers because the, especially if the fiber is on axis. But um, it's very, very, very sensitive to slight misalignments because uh, if uh, your lens is slightly misaligned with the fiber, then the coupling drops dramatically because you, meet, you get coma immediately and this that's why I say, well, these lenses have a very, very small field. Um, and have you drawn that, that right? Sorry? Have you drawn that A sphere right? Yeah. That's not reverse. No. <laughs> no. Um, the conicity constant here is equal to minus n squared. Uh, the conicity constant, you know what's, what's that? What's that quantity? Um, 
<coughs> the conic city constant characterizes the conic section of a surface. If it is lower than minus one, so it's a real number, and if it's lower than minus one, you've got an hyperbolic. If it's equal to minus one, you've got a parabolic. If it is e uh, larger than minus one, you have an ellipse. And of course, zero is the circle, the, the spherical surface. So, okay, so that's good for example one. So is that the kind of eight spheres that you buy? No, because otherwise we would have coma and our life would be terrible. Okay. But, um, well, this is the basics of, of, of what you should do, actually, if you want to optimize a lens. <coughs> suppose you have money and you want to have your lens custom. Uh, you start with this, and then you ask us to go beyond and kill common. Uh, second example, always in the same configuration. Um, you take the lens in the right orientation, the one you wanted. Well, what you find is that the only way to kill a third of the spherical aberration is to have a conicity constant that's related to the index of refraction this way, and this, you can prove, is larger than minus one. It's an ellipsoid. So this is an ellipse. And it kills spherical aberration of the third order, but only of the third order. The fifth order spherical aberration rapidly uh, grows and is negative. Uh, you gained in terms of field, come out appears, but later on. Typically, uh, if you take, um, I'm going to, yeah. Uh, if you if you take a lens that has a focal length of 80 millimeter with a numerical aperture of 0 0.5, um, which is typically the lenses we use in our experiments to trap single atoms, um, you would get coma in this case for a field angle equal to 0 0.02 degree. It means basically you can trap a single atom and that's it. No, don't think of, uh, of optical or of, 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 of arrays of atoms. If you use this configuration, well, actually, a uh, circle aberration of the fifth order is limiting and coma appears after beyond one degree field angle. Okay, uh, so these are special lenses. They are custom made and custom -made. Lenses with spherical surfaces. Is it possible to have uh, something that kills third order spherical aberration? The answer is yes, and not only spherical aberration of third order. It's possible if you use a so called akanetic meniscus. I'll, I'll talk about um, akanetism in a few minutes. But this is what it looks like. Point 
this you also have rigorous steel lens. So this 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 lens is rigorously stigmatic for this couple of points. So it is possible and it's actually much used in microscope objectives. Now bad news. Of course. Otherwise uh, I will talk about this. Um, cancellation of the spherical aberration of the third order is impossible if the object and image are both real. That's the, the bad news. Um, but one can minimize it. One can minimize it by using a so-called best shape lens. If you open catalogs, you will find lenses that are so-called best shape lenses. I'm going to explain what it means now because this is kind of puzzling what they call best shape lens. In my, in my opinion, I mean, what I would like is that the best shape lens in general is a lens that has a shape such that it minimizes spherical aberration of the third order. Right? So look carefully in the catalog to make sure that's true. Um, well, first of all, before I talk about best shape lens, what's the shape of a lens? All these lenses here have the same focal length. The length but they don't have the same shape. You characterize the shape of a lens by a parameter, x, which is called the bending parameter. This lens has a very strong bending parameter, positive. This lens here has a very strong bending parameter, exactly opposite. This lens here has no bending. It is perfectly by a plano convex lens in this orientation has a bending parameter that is equal to 1. This 1 is minus 1. Well, mathematically it's defined in such a way that we can remember it easily. It's basically the average of the curvatures divided by the difference of the curvatures. And since the difference of the curvature is first thin lens is directly related to n minus 1 and the focal length. It is equal to this quantity. Of course, you see that um, if the two curvatures are opposite, you've got a uh, bending parameter equal to 0. Now, there, are, there, there is a lot of info on this slide, so I'm going to explain. The calculations, the analytical calculations of the third order spherical aberration coefficients, A, in any configuration, Z, not necessarily infinite focus, but a Z, Z prime, okay? for any shape of lens, any X. Spherical lens. Yeah. Right. Is given by this terrible formula. But it's kind of simple if you, if you look from above. Well, of course, it's related to the image distance and the focal length. And it's a second order polynomial of the shape of the lens x squared, x. This is a constant. It is a function. These coefficients are, depend on the index of refraction and on the. Uh, configuration that you consider. M is another parameter that we call the conjugate parameter. It tells you basically if you're working in infinite configuration or not. Uh, M is normalized in such a way that infinite focus yields n equal plus 1. Infinite focus yields n equal plus 1. Focus infinite yields n equal minus 1. The 2f, 2f configuration yields n equal 0. This weird configuration yields an m factor that is very low. Okay. So you see that to have object and image both real, you need to have m between minus 1 and plus 1. So I simply plotted here. Basically, the quantity uh, inside the brackets here 
versus the shape of a lens for several sets of concrete parameters. Well, n equals zero is the two-wave, two-wave configuration. It never vanishes. M increases up to one, and you get this dashed parabola here. It never vanishes. And the other way around. If you want to cancel spherical aberration, you need to go to situations where n is larger than 1 or smaller than minus 1. Okay, so this proves that actually you cannot cancel spherical aberration of a third order if you have an object and an image that are both real. Okay, this is a nice diagram that represents what's going on, and actually here I have presented density line A equals zero. So you need, you see, you need to go and large, large M to have points where it cancels very well. Okay, so this point here, for instance, if I consider M equals plus one, infinite focus, there is a, a, a particular shape here for which you have a minimum spherical operation. This is the shape of the best shape lens, and it is related to n and the conjugate parameter in this way. Um, so, just a few examples. n equals 0, the 2f, 2f configuration. Well, that's quite intuitive. What kind of lens would you give me, would you sell me, if I want to use a lens in the 2f, 2f configuration? The biconvex, the perfectly biconvex one. The one that has a bending parameter equal to 0. Good. Infinite focus. Well, it's related to the index of refraction in this formula. I have plotted here a curve that I already show. Here, this is the uh, spherical aberration versus the index of refraction, so it decreases. And on the right axis, I have represented the best shape lens bending parameter as a function of the index of refraction. It increases nearly linear. So what does that mean? It means that if you, have, if you want to buy a lens for military applications uh, that work in the far infrared in Germania, Germania the best shape lens will be a meniscus. For instance, lenses that are used in infrared cameras you see in the night. They are made mostly of meniscus. Now, you are not concerned about military applications. You're concerned about working in the near infrared or in the visible range. So you're using regular gases like BK7, SF8, not even this lens. This glass set, CN, SE, is really for the uh, 3.5 to 6 micron wavelength range. So this, uh, these, the, 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 the lenses you will use mostly are in this range. And what you see is that the best shape lens is approximately It can even best. Not exactly. If you take 1 to 5, it's not exactly planar convex. But the one made in SF8 with this index of refraction is planar convex, and it is the best shape lens in the focus. OK? OK, so you cannot cancel spherical aberration of the third order, but you can minimize it. What if you're not happy and you, are, you want really to kill it? Well, pay more. <laughs> Buy a double. Um, I have to keep an eye on the time. I started at 1, right? So it goes until 2. I've got a quarter of an hour. You have 
have, in the doublet, you have four degrees of freedom. You have two powers, because you have two lenses. The doublet is not necessarily cemented. The doublet is two, a priori, two independent lenses with air space in between. So you have two focal lengths. And each lens has its associated bending parameter. So you've got four parameters that you can play. This allows you to control four things. The focal length of the ensemble is one thing. Primary actual chromatism is another thing. And then you can play, you can control two geometrical aberrations or one geometrical aberration plus a constraint such as you want the two lenses to be cemented. Okay. Uh, so controlling the focal length means you want to fulfill, you want to find f prime one and f prime two such that you fulfill this equation. Controlling the primary axial chromatism such that it be dual. show that it means that you should fulfill this equation here, which relates four quantities, focal distance of lens one, focal distance of lens two, ABBA number of lens one, ABBA number of lens two. Remember what the ABBA number means? That's the first thing actually. Okay. Yes. It characterizes the dispersion of the glass. Okay, so this set of two equations yields a unique solution for the couple of focal distances. And it says something that I have written in red. If you want to have a doublet with a given focal length and no primary actual chromatism, you need to combine two gases that have different average numbers one usually called a crown because it has a large avenue and another one that, has, that is called a flint because it has a low avenue and looking at the symmetry of these equations it says that one of the lenses should be converging the other one should be diverging okay, uh, this point I click The map of the shot gases, where you it's a map that says the refractive index versus the upper number. Uh, our friend the VK7 is here. Crowns are on the left on this vertical line, it's a high upper number. Flints are on the right, our friend is at five. Okay. Uh, these are regular gases. If you go in this direction, it's exotic. So we come back. Now, so you, you can buy a doublet, that, but it's, it doesn't kill a spherical aberration of the third order because it's not a domain. If you want to kill spherical aberration of the third order, you need to fulfill another equation, namely that the sum of the two wave aberrations associated with spherical aberration of each individual lens should compensate such that in the end it's equal to zero. So minus one fourth of A1 of a prime one to the power four plus this term for the lens two is equal to zero. As I said before, each of these uh, <coughs> coefficients for spherical aberration is a very complicated function of the index of refraction, focal then, the conjugate parameter and the shape. So, this is awful, but I said something important. I said each of these awful uh, expressions uh, depend quadratically on the shape. So, it's kind of obvious, right? You've got x1 squared in here, you've got x2 squared in here. If you want to cancel this, this is a 
quadric, a quadratic expression of x that mixes x2 and x1. Eventually, what you get is that this equation is the equation of a parabola, of a hyperbola in the space of x2 versus x1. It means that you have actually an infinity of couple of bending parameters, x1 and x2, that allow you to cancel spherical aberration of the third order. Each of the points on this, the two branches of these, this hyperbola, cancel SA3. So you have actually, if you're lucky, there is an infinity of solutions. Good. Now, going beyond, going beyond, uh, you want to kill the comma of the third order. One can show that this equation, CMA3 equals zero, amounts to putting a constraint, a linear constraint, between <coughs> the two bending parameters. So, killing SA3 and CMA3 is possible if you choose couples of points that are either here or there. Well, there is vocabulary here in the community. We call Fraunhofer doublets the, the ones that have the lower uh, bending parameters. And we call Gauss doublets the ones that have larger bending parameters. This is vocabulary. But, so you see that there is there are two couples of points, two families of couples. Okay, alternatively, you may think of you, you don't care about comma, but having airspace between the two doublets is a problem for some reason. Mainly, uh, you don't want to align the two. Okay, so you buy a cemented doublet. You don't have this degree of freedom. This puts yet another linear constraint between the two bending parameters. Yeah, cement, cement is uh, it's easy to say, but actually what it means is that you put a strong constraint between the second uh, surface of the first lens and the first surface of the second lens, right? They should have the same radius of curvature. This is yet another linear constraint, so you have, again, two solutions. Fortunately enough, there are couples of glasses now, couples of glasses that uh, wonderful that allow you to kill both CMA3 and have a cementic doublet. But this is miraculous. <laughs> so you should remember what they are. These couple of points have a name. It's not the unique one, but typically BK7 associated with SF5. Okay. This is one of them. Four labs, uh, one inch diameter, 150 focal length. Okay. Uh, right. These have a name. They are cemented and corrected for spherical aberration, so they have the name of Kale. And they have no comma, so you they are also no okay. So it's a clear one. Um, last, not least, uh, doublets perform well. The rule of thumb is up to numerical apertures on the order of 0 0.15. Okay. You may try to improve the performance up to 0 0.2, but it's going to be hard. So if you, well, you guys are interested in copying and bite into fibers. So you have all, you all know this company called Schefter Kirchhoff. They sell these, uh, these fiber collimators, right? Or four labs also does. And so you open the catalog. I did just before I came. Again, just to check that what I'm saying is true. Uh, there are two kinds of fiber collimators. There are doublets and there are SPs. And 
And typically, you can find doublets up to numerical averages of that. And if you want to go beyond, there are spheres. OK. Um, so. Before you get there, so yeah. quite often we do things at a single color. So we don't really care about <coughs> some issues. So yeah. can I, in principle, trade that in for correcting another high order aberration? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Unfortunately. Uh, there is a reason for that. And I think the proof is in this slide. I, until there is a line here, virtual line, okay? Here, I just deal with focal length and other numbers. So I, I'm dealing with the nature of the glass, and I'm dealing with the focal length without saying anything about the shape. When I start thinking about spherical operation, then I start talking about shape. This, uh, the hyperbolas and the, uh, and the constraints. And so these are two, two, two classes of problems that don't talk to each other. Sorry? No? No, no, no. I, I, I know this is not easy. I mean, this is not, e this is not easy. But all these lenses have the same photo lens. Yeah. One question, this is in terms of the Abbey number, which is defined in terms of three sort of arbitrary wavelengths. Not arbitrary, uh, well, 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 the visible range, and namely 656, 486, <laughs> and 586. <laughs> sure. But if you have an application at a specific wavelength. Oh, well, 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 that's very interesting, actually. That's very interesting. You guys want to image rubidium atoms at 780. You want to trap them at 852. And on top of that, you want to send a CO2 laser that will do uh, the 2D uh, something else. Well, you have to define, I mean, it's easy, right? You, all you have to know is how the index of, of refraction varies with the wavelength. And then you define your own other number by, I, 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 just actually also calculates that there you have three exotic wavelengths as long as you know as long as they're not too far from each other right you can define green index of refractions and basically the other number tells you what's the slope the average slope of that curve so that's why you shouldn't have wavelengths that are too far from but suppose you, you have a strictly monochromatic uh, Oh, now you've got the monochromatic system. Then, does, does the, do you just take the limit, you know, the, the slope at the wavelength of interest? Or? If you have a monochromatic application, you just don't care about this portion, so you don't care about the other number. It, it never comes into play. dedicated to the first problem I, I, I mentioned, the uh, curve plate of a microscope objective, which is which has typically a, a thickness e equal to 0 0.17 millimeter. One can, cal can calculate the spherical aberration coefficient that is linear with the thickness and varies with the uh, refraction index. And typically, microscope objectives uh, have magnifications ranging from 10 to 40 by 2 to 3, with numerical apertures going from 0 0.25 to 0.65. Here is the airy, the diameter of the airy pattern associated with these numerical apertures. What's the minimum spot I can make with that? Well, let's go from 
and this one which is a disaster. Uh, it's a very, very big spot. Uh, I mean, this is in the best circumstances, and the minimum scattered focus. It's even worse if you go to the fraction. Uh, this one is a little bit larger than the airy pattern. This one, well, there, it's nonsense because it's so small that it's smaller than the airy pattern. So, anyway, the spot will have this, the size of the airy pattern. Now, I in turn uh, suppose I'm not interested in imaging through the microscope objective, but I'm interested in focusing light. So my my problem is not having a small spot, but rather having a deep trap or intense uh, intense uh, a maximum a maximum peak intensity. So then I'm concerned about the trail ratio at the best focus, hence the star. The time stand you got nearly 100 percent. The times 25 you've got your limit fulfilling the criterion, the Marshall's criterion, 80%. With the times 40, it's a disaster. So, what, so again, I, I repeat, this, the situation is you are using a microscope objective that supposedly does its work well. You insert uh, a microscope uh, cover plate and you degrade the spot by these amounts. Now, in reality, it doesn't work this way. When you buy a microscope objective, it has been pre-compensated for the spherical aberration of a cover plate with a specified thickness, 0 than 17 millimeters. So, if you use that objective, but you forget to insert the cover plate, you got the problem negatively, okay? <laughs> okay. So, so this, this is my conclusion. You open the Thorlabs catalog, you find a bunch of aspheres that have been optimized. But these aspheres are meant to collimate a laser beam coming from a chip that's hidden in a, in a can behind a glass window. The sphere has been precompensated for the spherical aberration of the glass window. Your idea is that you want to use this aspherical lens for your own purposes. You buy a the box, you put it under a vacuum, and you want to trap your animals. But you don't pay attention. I mean, if you don't introduce a, a plate, a, a flat window with the right thickness, what you get is a disaster. Right? So you've got to find a way to compensate for that. So um, I'll stop here. Just the flavor minute. Um, so the flavor minute says uh, I'm going to talk about third order coma. I'm going to talk about astigmatism and field curvature. I'll try to convey simple ideas in simple cases, and uh, and then I'll go with you. So that that will take approximately half an hour, and then I'll go with you through a practical example, we are going to build our own doublet uh, from scratch with OCT. So we'll go through all the steps of building our own simple system so that we have so that you can make your optics yourself at, at the end of the lecture. Okay? Okay. So before we go, uh, let's try to meet here I'd like to say a little earlier than three. So we don't have quite half an hour. Is that okay with people? That okay, we tend to. And the second question I was going to ask is, do you want to, uh, I, I don't know if everybody knows why spherical lenses are so much cheaper and easier. Like, why are they so common if they've got such, oh, such aberration? Oh yeah. I've got a simple answer. Um, producing a spherical surface with glass thing in the world. All you have to do is polish, and human being can polish randomly very well. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't think. And, and hence you produce a, a, a spherical surface. That will be much, much better actually than any spherical surface that can be produced by machines, which is pseudo-randomness. 
Um, so that's why it's cheaper, because now if you want to build an S here, that's another matter. It's hours and hours of optimization. If it's manual, it's going to cost a fortune, because the way you do it, how do you build an S here? Uh, in the aspherical surface. Say, for instance, you want to, to, to build this hyperboloidal uh, lens I told you about. It's going to cost you a fortune because if you have, well, the first thing is you start from a sphere. And then you want to have a hyperboloid. Well, you've got to remove matter in the right way. This is the glass here. You've got to build this, right? You've got to remove matter. So all this should go away. So you polish a little bit, so you remove, not in the center, you remove at the edge, a little bit here, a little bit there. Now it's not randomness anymore. It's perfect control. Each time you take the lens and you go to the interferometer, you put Put it there, you align it, takes one hour. And then you look at the fringes and you count the fringes, or you have the computer do it for you. Analyze the profile. If you are not happy, go back to the room, <coughs> polish again, go back to the room, measure the interference, the interprogram, and so on. Okay, so it's iterative and it takes forever. Fortunately, companies like Lightpath have developed uh, molded glasses, and it doesn't cost a lot, a lot. So what they do is they machine a mold with a diamond, and then, well, and they program the computer that they want this surface and not another one. <laughs> and then they pour the liquid glass in the air, and it freezes, and they get their ass here. And it works brilliantly. So, unfortunately, oh yeah, yeah, unfortunately, so it costs 100 bucks if you buy it from the catalog because the, se the, the, the series is basically millions of them. Okay. What we did in our lab is we had one custom made by Lightpath. We, we, we said we, we wanted uh, 10 of them. They said, well, you can as well have 100 or 1,000. <laughs> so it's going to be the same, you know. <laughs> it's going to be $25,000. <laughs> and the reason for that is because they got to make the mold. And, and apparently, producing the mold is, is something that, that is terrible. I mean, we did the optical study. We did the, the optimization. They had to do nothing, just plug in the numbers. Costs fortune. So yeah, because the, these aspherical lenses that cost one hundred bucks, the, the, you find them in all your CD players. So, 